predictability. Um, you know, the science behind predictability is something that's very interesting, especially in the gaming space. As game developers, game publishers, you guys are almost like the puppet masters. You guys should actually design your games and design how users actually behave. In a study that was done by the New England uh, Institute of Systems, uh, they basically looked at the prediction difficulty against behavior. It's very difficult to basically um, look at behavior when things are, especially around multitasking. If you look here, on the left quadrant, um, you'll, you'll see here that if each individual does the same thing, it's relatively easy to actually predict what's going on. No science behind that. If you go into the second where a collective group of people actually do a similar task, or even different tasks, we're able to group them out. Possible. When you start having groups of people do different things, um, it becomes questionable. There's the data that you can actually extract from that and predict what a user does. Now, when people start doing whatever they want, that's when it's pretty much impossible to try to figure out and how to predict or your prediction model will be able to do things that um, extract valuable data to either make your game better, monetize, or even help your user acquisition. This is my Amazon account. Um, the study found that when you start targeting individual users, obviously there's a higher accuracy rate in terms of how you predict that user's behavior. The challenge is when you start looking at individual behaviors and looking at multiple behaviors, um, how do you predict that and how do you start grouping that to make sure they can um, maximize that? This is basically um, using e-commerce to basically give an example of how um, the prediction recommendations engines are typically taking data that are useful, but unfortunately, the wrong user. My wife and I share an Amazon account. This is obviously mine. You can see here what was recommended. Two days ago, she basically was looking at cooking uh, or baking items. And below that are what my kids watch. It's obviously that because I'm not using the, the account uh, and the data and recommendation and just pulling predictive things that are happening a few past days, they're, they're pretty well to back. I asked my wife, are you looking at baking goods because I don't see anything in cart for me to purchase. When you're looking at data that's more recent, um, it's very important because external data is something that people buy into today. Large data dumps. When you're missing timestamp for data, it becomes pretty useless. Imagine a collection of things I look at over time. If I were just buying you know, gifts um, in a certain season, and there's no timestamp around when I'm looking at these items, I just take external data into your predictive analysis or model, that data becomes completely irrelevant. And it happens a lot. Imagine if you're doing advertising and you're buying external data of targets, you know, profiles, and the timestamps are missing from it. It's very difficult because of the fact that the recency is gone. Um, you know, I was working at Samsung prior to joining Akamai, so I would do a lot of research around consumer electronics on my home PC. And one of the challenges was that the fact that I wiped out my cookies, obviously. It's been two years later, and I'm now seeing actual um, issues with the advertising that was targeting. I'm getting a lot of consumer electronic advertisements that's targeted to me. The challenge is these profiles, because the data sets you bought maybe two years ago that are still sitting in your, in your repository, are pulling data sets that don't have timestamps against them. You can see, if you look at the last two years, I probably have not looked at a single consumer electronics uh, research or, or item through my browse history. And that, that data is being resold. And it's not recent enough for you guys to actually create predictive uh, analysis around targeting the right proper ads, or even delivering the right content. Another challenge that's happening around why predictive analysis from external sources is going to be important is the fact that in network conditions, we're having issues globally, worldwide, with bandwidth. ITU did a study around what's happening. We're getting faster connectivity globally, but the challenge is, there's not enough bandwidth. With these issues happening, especially with devices growing, the number of devices have outgrown the human population. 
which is going to allow you to start thinking whether or not your game design for connectivity is something that you have to think about and redesigning things to have offline capabilities. You're two or three years away from this. We all know in the gaming space, you're going to have to kind of reap the benefits now. And I'm bringing up the issue around external data sources around network conditions for your game. When you're trying to predict what's happening with the user, what's happening in the game state, you have your network connection state where if things aren't working, things aren't connected, and the user's not able to connect to your game, you're able to, you're able to get that data back, correct? But the challenge is, if you're looking at external data sources, if you're not looking at external data sources, you're not, you're not realizing that the connection speed has issues. And factoring that into your game development is going to be important on trying to make your user a little more sticky environments like in Southeast Asia. Player-centric approach. In a player-centric approach, there's two things that you look at. Entertaining and uh, uh, empathizing. The entertainment aspect is ensuring that your users, your players, have the best experience possible with your game. Second, empathizing. Why are users getting frustrated? Is your game too hard? You know, are, are things, in, are your games too challenging? Are there things in your games, you know, too boring, too repetitive? What if the user is getting disconnected every time they're playing? The third thing you should be looking at is environment. That environment factor is that external data source I'm talking about to help with your prediction model. Slow mobile actually frustrates people, right? Slow connection is a mobile connection, that's a given. But there's data out there that's going to allow you to be able to take and to, to, to uh, you know, affect what do you need to do to make your game work better. And, it, and especially in states when, they're, when, when you're in subways where connectivity is spotty with mobile connectivity. Having offline mode, having pre-positioning of things that whether you're ad supported or a, a freemium based model or even a paid, what are things you can do to have content for your customers or your players to work with when things are not working? I don't know if you guys experienced this before, but I sure do. When I'm in the subway, disconnection happens relatively often in certain areas of even in Singapore. Uh, but games are multiplayer, obviously connection is utmost important. That's your gameplay, right? Being able to do multiplayer um, battles. But there are things that you can probably do around there because there's monetization avenues that you need to think about in offline. Uh, I know that in the Philippines, uh, a lot of game companies do look at offline. I, I, we used to outsource games from Viacom in the Philippines. Um, offline was always asked because you need offline mode. I go, well, I'm, I'm actually targeting markets like Korea, Japan. I don't think I'll need offline mode. Ten years fast forward, um, the thought behind it is when I moved to Southeast Asia, offline mode or having some type of offline capability is becoming something of the need. If you're looking at companies like Netflix, Amazon, Spotify, these are consumer uh, entertainment apps that actually have offline capabilities because of the fact that there's network conditions and network limitations. When your people are traveling, and the fact that capacity of networks is just not enough. We all knew, knew about the Mario launch that happened in December. You know, one of the, the blunders around here was they had pretty much most of your gameplay that did not have network dependencies, but yet they decided to make it network dependable. You'll need to basically understand the fact that when your users are playing, um, a lot of the metrics that gaming companies do use are around the churns, you know, the LTVs, things like that, network connectivity, but it's within the app. We need to start looking at the environment. That environment app is around what that data, what that connection speed, it's not the speed, it's a reliability around the connection speed that needs to be added into your predictive analysis around how you're going to build the game better, how, the, how are the people playing, and what are the issues they're running into, especially when they get disconnected, like my show earlier. There's an opportunity around predictive around advertising. Well, um, this is just Singapore Chang Airport. I was able to pull this data off the Chang Airport website. 55.5 um, million passengers go through that airport this year, up to uh, last year, November, January, to November. 
there is great opportunity basically to start looking at introducing offline capabilities in games, especially in markets that you're targeting in Southeast Asia. But not only in Southeast Asia, you're looking at the Americas, Europe, we all have this issue. But there's a lot more travelers than we ever seen before. There was an increase of 5.6% uh, year on year with, with traveling. And imagine for us, we all traveled into Philippines or even commuted uh, into this event. Think about what's happening when you're able to get attention. One of the challenges with advertising is that we have too much content for users to look at. The attention spans of users are going away, and how do you want to get that attention? But there's a monetization aspect I'm talking about predictability here is the fact that if you're able to detect airplane mode on a user and be able to know what's going to happen if this person is a frequent traveler or not, having an offline capability and potentially introducing offline ads or offline gameplay, you could, you're going to probably be able to look at monetization um, opportunities. I took this in-flight sales activity that was happening, um, why people buy. Um, People have impulsive buying behaviors, just like they have on the ground. But when you're in the air, uh, there's a few things that happen. You have utmost attention of the passenger. A lot of us do work, but the thing is, we're not going to be, unless we have a deadline before we land, the chances are we're going to steer away and start drifting. In-flight entertainment is fantastic, but the problem is that a lot of people want to access things that are on their device. A few behaviors that happen on the plane. One. Portal. Two, something that they're doing, an activity that do, we're doing on the ground that they want to continue, and usually people are playing games um, when they, before they get on a plane. If they want to continue that, is there a way for them to continue that? Third is impulse. And impulse is where that opportunity actually rises, right? When you talk about impulse. And you look at in-flight sales, why are people buying on there? Um, the prices on the plane aren't necessarily cheaper than DFS on, on ground or due to free shops. But the study has shown that certain parts of the day, certain parts of the time, when the user is captive, you're able to actually potentially monetize. Having offline syncing in your game could potentially allow for additional revenue when people are in the air. Let me give you a figure that I just kind of roughly ran based on looking at things. Um, In-flight Wi-Fi is happening, but the, one of the challenges is only giving one, one megabit to two megabits per second, and it's very costly. The challenge of playing games with this type of connectivity on the plane is very difficult. So let me give you this opportunity analysis that you know, I just kind of ran based on Asian, the Asia Pacific flights of passengers on Air, Asian airlines against you know, potentially existing user base that you may have you know, a 70% MAU, 2% uh, conversion rate, 2% conversion rate, maybe at a dollar twenty. There's a gross annual revenue of 2.6 million just just for Asian airlines, Asian passengers. Um, you saw with Changi, they had what 55.5 million uh, from January to November. This is actually a one-month figure of what what's happening, um, 26 million. But look at the gross annual revenue that potentially can happen. So having offline capabilities is, is, is potentially something that we should start exploring and looking at. And especially with the global capacity issue, you know, faster connection doesn't mean a reliable connection. And what about in-game ads? There's technology today that allows you to basically pre-position content on devices, just like something like Netflix. With user profile data that's in your app already, you could potentially pull ads into the devices uh, when someone goes offline or have them stored on a weekly basis when they're charging or on Wi-Fi connectivity. There's a few things that you're doing here for players. Data is not cheap, especially in Southeast Asia. We, we, we hear it all the time. It's also expensive for different classes of people in, in different countries. With in-game advertising opportunities to be added uh, for offline, you can do one of two things. You could basically get more relevant ads and also brand impact for, for your advertisers. There are studies that have been shown that when you have someone attentive and 
and interacting with your ads, the chances for recall is much higher. And if you're able to get their attention, um, especially with the interaction, you get 3x the recall. If there's no call to action because you're in offline mode, brand advertising tends to work relatively well. Um, I'm not sure if you guys fly Singapore Air much or any of the airlines that have advertising. Singapore Air 777, um, their interface or interaction between the air flight system forces you to watch still images as you click through to get to your content. As much as I hate the advertising on planes, my interaction with that ad has imprinted Park Royal Hotel. I've never heard of that hotel ever, but that Park Royal Hotel stuck in my head. And this, I, I do fly off and I do see that ad pretty often. The fact that they're offline and, and interacting with that ad, the, the recall rate's quite high. And having it also offline reduces the, the data charges that they would have when they're actually on commute, in flight, or anywhere where they have to be offline. If you look here, um, Tech Nation does study around the data costs and how much it costs in the emerging markets uh, for an hourly wage worker to be able to afford data. So for the Philippines, let's look at here. The, um, based on 2015, the figures was roughly about one gigabyte of data would be about seven dollars and ten cent, right? Um, and if you look at the number of hours that we would have to work at minimum wage at 69 cents, it would be 10, dollars, 10 hours and 17 minutes in order for them to pay for one gig of data. Now, obviously when you have ad supported games, having offline ads adds to two things. If you're able to pre-position advertising over Wi-Fi, you're reducing the cost of that being that content being stored. And now if you refresh on a daily per basis, if people are going to the office and they have Wi-Fi in the office, you're going to be putting maybe two or three ads that are relevant to them, which they can actually access without going back to the ad server and syncing the ad, uh, ad uh, logic you know, when the connectivity is a little more stable or even on Wi-Fi. And here you see the survey around here uh, around data packaging pricing being one of the, uh, the top reasons why um, people are either switching network or trying to explore for better ways to get um, uh, better pricing versus the network. See here in the Philippines, price is uh, a primary issue in terms of um, the packages that are available in the market. Uh, this is a study done by Deloitte. So pre-position of content. Um, talk about external environments, talk about how that predictive analysis can be done back to your predictive model. A lot of mistakes are made around predictive models that you take something that's going, that you know that's going to happen, and you dump it back into a predictive model. When you take predictive, uh, when you take data that's known, and you dump it back into a model, you're not doing justice in terms of how you're predicting. The rationale behind that is predict what the user is going to do versus what they've done already. Right, or what they're going to do. The rationale behind that is you're building AI around the predictive data that's going to run some of the different assumptions, recommendations that you push to your players or users. You're not going to get the most accurate model because of the fact that your predictive engine is going to break because you're putting data sets in that you know. Preposition context is a concept of the fact that you're actually placing content that they're likely going to watch. You have this character over here dreaming about Games of Thrones, the next game level that they potentially look, sports scores. What they're trying to fetch is over the evening time when you have a stable connection or whether you're in an office space and don't have broadband connected at home, you're taking advantage of stable connectivity to push content to the end user. You're not just pushing the content of what's happening. Obviously, you have your consumer data app within your game and what they're doing. But it's all also adding a layer of what's happening in the environment. And what I mean by environment is what's that connectivity state? How often does this person hit spotty Wi-Fi spots or spotty mobile spots? Those are things that you're basically determining and adding in there to determine what you're prepositioning. Are you prepositioning or caching the entire content piece? No. It could be a piecemeal. It could be one level. It could be a live event 
a, a new game event that you might be running that's just a portion of that that's pushed to the user. Uh, that could be potentially accessed both offline and online, um, intermediary or interchangeable. Or it could be a video. Um, if you talk about advertising, if, if you want to put the whole advertising on there, um, obviously the experience would be fantastic. But um, in terms of like longer clip videos, it might be just the first 20 seconds. So that, that's a concept of prepositioning. And the predictive nature of the fact that you're able to take content and, and feed it through and predict whether or not they're going to use it. It's not a guarantee that they're going to access this content, but when they do access this content, the player experience will be pretty seamless. Just give you a case study that happened. Um, miners in Australia basically work weeks and months um, underground. A company in Australia came to us for some help on figuring out how to get content to these miners. Now, this content, this, this company that provides um, basically internet connectivity to a, to a certain limit connects back to, by satellite um, from the surface back down, I think quite twice a day in terms of fetching content. And the content is then put into a storage below underground where the miners are staying or have during, during the rest of the time. We use predictive analysis around what the miners you know, on the devices are doing to capture that. And we didn't actually pre-position any content the first two to three weeks. What we did was collected the behavior around what was happening with the miners and what they were accessing. Aggregating that, looking at the network conditions, basically they were pulling from you know, one location right above surface and figuring out what point of time we actually can deliver content to the miners. And you see here, um, the predicted nature around is that we have to collect enough data and timestamp them to look at the relevancy of the content that we push down to them. Um, the two top contents that were being watched were video contents and news. It was very difficult to get real-time news to them, but we were able to get at least the daily news to the miners. So, the whole case around this was we were able to successfully use external data to basically you know, the, the software provider that was providing the, the content and different uh, services to the miner, the mining company, uh, we're adding a layer on top of that data set. And, and we're able to basically provide better mapping of what the type of contents that we're getting uh, uh, to the miners. And it's ironic, irony behind this because there's several industries um, to date that basically don't have network connect connectivity. Um, obviously, this is the extreme case. If you're thinking about Southeast Asia markets like Indonesia, Vietnam, as well as um, you know the parts of the Philippines, you, you, having an offline mode with predictive capabilities is going to help you be able to provide great player experience. So I'll leave the floor open for any questions. Now, time. Good with time. I'll take any questions around um, external data sets, network environment, um, in a little greater detail. Um, either outside or I could take some questions now. Anyone? Anyone interested? So, for folks that don't know what Akamai does, I obviously didn't go traditional route which is what we do as a company. Akamai basically is a content delivery network. Um, we work with you know, 28 out of the top 30 publishers providing downloads of updates, patches, as well as our game downloads for PC environments. Uh, we also look at security. Uh, you saw the recent attack with eSports. Um, we're one of the biggest security companies for DDoS protection. Um, we also provide, you know, I think Patrick was talking about uh, bot uh, fraud earlier. We also provide a lot of data intelligence around bots, uh, different IP addresses, because of the fact that we look at the internet on a day-to-day -day basis and have a lot of data that actually could be extrapolated for uses uh, for whether it's security, uh, predictive content delivery, um, in addition to scalability and reliability. A lot of what we're seeing today in the network environment, again, it's not speed. Speed's growing. Uh, more, and people, more and more people are going online, but there's also more devices going on. So as you guys walk out of this room, 
you know, key takeaways really is, you know, factoring the player's environment, you know, data from outside the game, how that's going to help your game. Because the network connectivity within the app, that metric alone will not actually determine what the problems your users are facing. Uh, it's much harder with multiplayer type of games, I admittedly have that, um, but looking at creative ways to create mini games that may create uh, offline playability, like for example, if I want to sort my deck of cards on the Clash of Clans without connecting, that's one way to basically allow for the game to be accessed offline uh, or in a, in, a, in a spotty mobile state. Um, anticipate for offline scenarios, right? Uh, lastly, is design for content prepositioning. Um, when you start looking at content, you know, Apple has their on resource demand, um, on demand resource, sorry, on demand resource capabilities that allows you to basically break your games into different levels, determine what content you delivered. Um, in addition to um, what we have at Akamai, we have some SDK clients that can actually help you assist um, with the different prepositioning content to the games. It also reduce, you know, the game sizes and also help the fact that you're helping your players, you know, potentially save on data in terms of data costs um, and getting content on your devices. All right, I'll let you guys ponder a little bit and thank you and hope you know, have a great lunch. All right, thank you very much.